The following is brought to you by Total Seal Piston Rings, the leader in ring seal technology. TotalSeal.com Hello and welcome to another edition of Hidden Horsepower, presented by Total Seal Piston Rings. I'm Joe Costello. We have got another great episode for all you podcast listeners out there. I am once again joined by my co-host. He is the director of technical sales at Total Seal Piston Rings. When you ring him up, there's a good chance you're going to get this guy, Keith Jones. Keith, welcome back. How are you? I am doing great, Joe. It's a, we'll just say, wonderful day here in Arizona. The, the heat's finally broken. We're in the 80s. And man, I'm loving it. It's uh, we're we're getting towards the end of the racing season. A lot of championships on the line. You know, we'll just say it's an exciting time to be in this business, and and darn glad to be part of it. Absolutely. And PRI. thank you again for the great introduction. PRI coming up, which is very exciting. Total Seal going to be a big part of that. You mentioned championships. It is. It is a critical and interesting time of the season. This particular episode, I am very interested in this because uh, this is right in the wheelhouse of, of drag racing and NHRA drag racing. We're going to have a, uh, a second visit from one of our previous guests, and you guys put this one together, and it's very interesting because it's something that I'm calling the action on a regular basis, but you know they're very fast cars, but very specific for what they're doing. We're talking about NHRA index racing, dot ninety racing, super gas, super comp, super street, and how you might build an engine differently. So we've got Gary Stinnett back. Tell us before we bring on Gary, how did this all come up, Keith? Well, you know, a couple different conversations. You know, there was one between you and I and about a particular project that you and Gary happen to be working on. And I'll I'll, I'll let you tease that part in. And, uh, and just, you know, some conversations with some different customers about these types of engines and how things might differ with these types of engines versus, say, you know, their equivalent displacement brethren that are going into, you know, let's say a, a, a top dragster or maybe, you know, something where we're, we're not index racing and how the builds may differ. And, of course, the very first person that came to my mind to ask that kind of a question to was, of course, Gary. You know, four-time champion, uh, I, I can't think of a guy that I could, you know, in, in my circle of friends, uh, that would be more knowledgeable about this subject than Gary. So it's getting to the point where now we've got like the, uh, you know, the group of friends of Hidden Horsepower. So let's bring him on the show, Mr. Gary Stinnett. Gary, welcome back to Hidden Horsepower. How are you? Good, guys. Uh Good afternoon, and thanks for having me on. No, thrilled to have you on. And this is a hot topic. Um this style of racing, index racing, dot ninety racing. If you've heard the podcast, you know we've got round track guys, we've got dirt track guys, we've talked to V eight supercar guys. Many people don't realize that there are what would you call it? A couple of thousand index racers around the country at any given time doing NHRA divisional racing, their own super series regional stuff that are trying to run 890, 990, or 1090 and building their engines maybe specifically for it. Uh, I hate to correct your numbers, but at last count, NHRA had issued over 6,000 super comp licenses and over 5,000. This is a number of years ago, actually. Um, so there's probably 20,000 or maybe 25,000 superclass racers at any given time licensed. And uh, so there are a lot of competitors in this. And, and you mentioned NHRA, but there's still some uh, IHRA stuff out there. And then there's a lot of um, associations in the, in the uh, Atlantic East Coast and, uh, and the West Coast. And so there's a lot of superclass racers around for sure. Very exciting, and uh, I wanted you to correct me. I, I threw up the ball, right, like, uh, you know, a range, yeah. and uh, it's always better when the range is higher than what I what I actually said. And you have won four Super Comp World Championships in this style of racing. For those that don't know, let's explain it real quick, right? We put an index on the board, same for both uh, drivers. In uh, one case, it's 890. In one case, it's 990. In one case, it's 1090. You want to get to the finish line first without running under the index. It sounds simple. Yeah, it's, it sounds simple. That's as, that's as far as that goes. It's as complicated as any of the categories in any of the classes. 
and uh, you know for a long time and I, maybe not even for a long time maybe still today a lot of the guys that don't understand or know it have never been around it think it sounds pretty simple but uh, I guarantee you if you've ever been involved in one and tried and you can ask uh, some of the pro teams the Torrances for example that that run both super comp and and um, top fuel but even uh, Robert Height whose daughter Autumn has started in this and he's been over at my trailer and I've tried to explain stuff to him and and uh, and their eyes just glaze over be like trying to explain you know the top fuel clutch and everything to uh to a stock eliminator driver it's it's quite a bit of difference but it's still a lot of high technology going on there and so engine building for index or dot 90 is it you know how similar how dissimilar what what are we talking about if you are planning and to mention what Keith talked about, uh, if you listen to WFO Radio, my you know original podcast, um, we're doing something called Project Pontiac, which is an old bracket car that I had originally. It was going to be a uh, a rebuild. Gary was going to do the rebuild, but unfortunately, as sometimes is the case, rebuilds turn into whole new projects. That's where we are, and so there's a lot of conversation going on about what are we using this for. What's the point of this car? Are we going for low ET or are we trying to win races in index racing, which is what we're trying to do? And um, some decisions have had to be made one direction or the other based on the fact that we're going index racing with Project Pontiac. Yeah, so, you know, basically what I've, I've been in business now 40 years and I started running Super Comp in, in the late 80s, 88, 89 was my first year I ran for you know, nationals and divisionals. So I've seen this a lot. And um, what happens is people think, well, I've got a bracket car we put together, maybe a back half car, ladder bar thing, this, that, or, or maybe even a hardtail dragster. And, you know, it runs, it runs pretty close to the 890 or 990 or 1090 index. I think I'll go do a little bit of that super class racing. You know, it looks like it's pretty simplistic, and I got a car that can do it because I can – do well at my bracket racing on Saturday nights. And so that's how you get hooked. And the thing about it that's funny is that car is as a, as a bracket car on a Saturday night, probably about as far off from being a super highly winning competitive championship winning race car in the super classes as it could be. And so you see this time and time again, as people start, um, start at the bottom. I mean, I did my first dragster was a small block hardtail it would only go 890 and within the, that first year i realized wow um the weather got really slow today and i can only go 897 i'm out i got beat and so the, the next thing you do is you build a bigger motor so we can run 890 all the time well now you got to have a throttle stop and we got to slow it down to 890 most of the time and then from there you go into well now i'm getting chased by everybody because i can only go 150 some mile an hour so now we got to build a bigger motor yet, and that means more throttle stop, and then that means a better chassis, and it exponentially gets to the point where today, um, if uh, John Force Racing wanted a current brand new super comp dragster with state of the art best money can buy every single thing, it's going to spend one hundred twenty five thousand dollars before he hits the track. So it gets carried away, but that's what it takes if you want to win a want to win a world championship at the elite level. So like your Pontiac, Joe, we came in with an old bracket engine. Um, you'd won a lot of races and championships in that, that car, and that engine, but now you want to go 1090 racing and you want to have a good piece. And so all of a sudden the old stock block just isn't going to be adequate enough to make the kind of power you want to make. And then the crank isn't good enough. And now we got to have good rods and pistons and, and on so forth and so on. We need better heads to flow more air to make more power so we can run a little bit more speed so we're not getting chased by everybody. And uh, it's uh, uh, down the path you go, right? Yeah, a new a, a rebuild turns into an all-new project. Uh, but, hey, um, this is the journey, and that's the thing, and this is what I want to do. And I'm out there calling the action every weekend and watching the racing and thinking, you know, Jegs All-Stars, double O one to trip zip. I could do that. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> right now, Keith, jump in yeah. with a question from the uh, from the ring seal side, from the engine builder side, uh, something that will 
you know, send us down the trajectory of what we're trying to accomplish here. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Gary and I kind of touched on it on the other day, but you know, so let's say I'm, you know, I, you know, I, I roll into you know Gary Stinnett Racing Engines, and I, you know, I'm looking at a 565, kind of a big Chevy, you know, not every single thing, but you know, Gary, you know, points of conversation, you know, I, I'm coming at you like I want to build a trot dragster engine, or I want to build, you know, a super comp motor. What what pieces do you know in your mind right off the bat? Well, okay. You know, and I'm just spitballing here. I mean, okay, I got to have a different, you know, the carburetor's got to be different. I, I want a different cylinder head. Uh, you know, maybe I need to change that camshaft a little bit between these two because I need an engine that works well with the throttle stop versus an all-out power engine. Could you kind of highlight, you know, we'll say those little secrets that maybe you're willing to give up or maybe not, you know, to the to the novice builders or, that are out there that maybe, you know, hey, they, you know, they don't build a piece as good as you are. Maybe you could give them a little, a little nugget, you know, give them, point them the right way. Well, I thought the name of the show was Hidden Horsepower. Now you're asking me, for this should be called Unhidden Horsepower. We're going to tell I, I was here. just thinking the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, uh, when, a, when a customer calls and they're, they're, you know, talking about doing something, the first thing, obviously, is the budget. And the second thing is how fast you want to go, which of those two are tied together. You've all heard it a million times. It's, you know, how fast you want to go, how much do you want to spend. But... um so one of the big questions is aluminum block versus iron block. And, uh, you know, 20 or 30 years ago, people said, oh, the aluminum blocks don't make as much horsepower and they're not as consistent. I heard that over and over again. I made the switch in 2006 uh, midseason, and I believe it was a 565 that I had. And I had the, the, the iron block, and it was, it was dynoed and it was running good. And I got a new aluminum block from Dart and machined it all up in mid-July. Just swapped everything over, put it back on the dyno. And the first thing I found with conventional rings was I lost 30 horsepower. And so I got with Keith, and we, we talked it through. We got some total seal gapless rings and changed up the hone a little bit, put it back, and bingo, all the horsepower came back. So an aluminum block can make the same power as an iron block. It requires a different cylinder wall finish and a set of gapless rings from Total Seal. And uh, they will be as consistent. In fact, without a vacuum pump, our, uh, our dry sump engines routinely make 22, 23 inches of vacuum just with a four-stage dry sump pump. And that's the proof. I mean, vacuum is it. So the first thing, you know, you have to decide whether you do an iron block or aluminum. Of course, back in the day, everybody ran, you know, a cheap set of Speed Pro rings that were 16, 16, 3, 16. We don't use that anymore. We haven't used those in 20 years. Now, the typical um, rings package for a superclass engine is always 043, 043, 3 millimeter. Um, it does a great job, and it lasts 300, 400 runs. And um, you really don't have to go to the next step like we do in super stock comp eliminator. I don't think you need to have a 0.7 or 0.8 millimeter in a super class engine. The 43s will do an excellent job and last a long time and and are, you know, somewhat economical compared to those other rings. So as far as cylinder heads go, that's where the money comes in and how fast you want to go. Um, again, the I almost everything we do anymore, we convince the, the customer that they need to have uh, copper beryllium seats and get away from the ductile iron seats especially if you run a titanium valve. And we're probably 50-50 on people that run uh, tie valves versus stainless. Um, obviously, the advantage of a tie valve is it's lighter, so the valve spring, it's easier on the spring and the valve train and lives a little bit longer, especially with the coated valves today. Um, just, I guess, more hidden horsepower secrets. Um, if you're a home builder, spend the extra money and get the tie valves coated. They will, that, that lasts in the eternity i mean they never wear and so if you if you do if you do elect to stay with stainless valves then just the same thing with the copper beryllium seats uh an exhaust valve even though people call them stainless valves they're not pure stainless so they do rust and we have a lot of examples in here in old valve boxes with pits on top of the exhaust valves and I, i've been surprised with our product product that we sell fog it that we created to to combat and 
rust and corrosion and keep the cylinder walls clean. I've been really surprised talking to engine builders that would, didn't know why they had pits on top of their exhaust valves until I explained that they weren't pure stainless. They did, in fact, rust and corrode, but then they got superheated again to 13, 1500 degrees, and it burned all the rust off, but it left the pits. So um, if you're going to build a super class engine or even a bracket engine and you can afford the upgrades to go to uh, copper beryllium seats and, and even tie valves, that solves the rust and corrosion in that part. If you can't afford to do that, then you can't afford to buy a twenty dollar can of fog it. <laughs> Shameless plug there, but so basically, um, it's not a lot different than building a top dragster engine in those departments: ring seal, valve seal, materials, and spend the money to get the good stuff. Where you get into a big difference um, between a top dragster or high end, a very fast bracket engine, or even a a high-end super stock, comp eliminator, even pro stock, is it becomes about velocity and having a good signal through the carburetor and through the throttle stop to when you change RPMs from leaving wide open or on a chip a, a high RPM and then dropping it down to the throttle stop RPM and then bringing it right back up to the converter stall and then out to the finish line. In a, in a wide open race car, such as, let's use a comp eliminator, they don't need to have much velocity velocity simply because they're going the rpm is going to fix that problem so to get airspeed through a carburetor you can either do it with large cubic inches or you can do it with high rpm but we need velocity and most throttle stop cars um, and we this wasn't a math equation in 1989 we just had to figure this out um, the trial and error is we ended up being around 4200 on the stop now, there are people out there that have made programs work below that, but that's the go-to start off for everybody. Um, we have been doing throttle stop carburetors here for over 35 years, and when I build a carburetor every day and ship it out, the guy wants to know where to start the throttle stop RPM at. You start it at 4,200. You may be able to go down to 4,000, but it really depends on what cylinder head, the camshaft, and the carburetor and manifold size. So the problem a lot of people do is they over-carburate or over-cylinder head or over-camshaft, and then they, ha they don't have enough velocity to make the thing work good at 4,200. So when it leaves it, say, say they got a 5,000 or 5,500 chip on the starting line, and they let go of the trans brake, and it flashes up to whatever their converter flashes to, say 60, 2, 3, 4, 500, and then immediately the throttle stop actuates and brings it back down to 4,200. It needs to reasonably flatline. To me, people get anal about it being exactly 4,200 the whole time. It doesn't have to be. It's okay if it crawls a little bit up and goes on the stop at 4,200 and comes off at 4,300. That's acceptable, and it will repeat like that. But if you don't have good velocity because any one of these things is off, I mean the carburetor size, manifold size, intake runner size, and the camshaft, then when it's on that stop at that 4,200 RPM range, it will actually dip down like a bog and then a choke on itself and kind of come back to life, and it will never repeat and be consistent. So through measurement of velocity through the venturi of the carburetor is really critical to get all that the same where it all matches. So, for example... If we have a 1050 Dominator on gas on a 582, and we have it at 4,200 RPM, and if we put a sensor in the side of the carburetor to measure airspeed, let's assume we had 350 feet per second at that moment when we're at 4,200. If all we do is take that carburetor off and put on an 1150, because it's a bigger Venturi, then when you go on that same throttle stop RPM, it's not going to go to 4,200 because you don't have the airspeed. So the, the airspeed will drop down to, say, 280 feet per second. To get it back to 350 where it's happy, we may have to have the throttle stop RPM. Math tells us it would need to be at, like, 4,600. So then we take that off. We put a 1250 on the same engine, and to get back to 350 feet per second, we're going to have to be at 5,100 RPM on the stop. If you're at a higher RPM on the stop, 
you're going to run faster than you were running 890. So you're going to have to add more timer numbers to get it back to 890, kind of offsetting the horsepower gain you picked up with the bigger carburetor. Does that make sense to you guys? Makes sense to me. Oh, yeah. But, you, yep. you know, for, so, for folks out there listening, like, you, you, uh, you're you going down the track, right? It's a defined 1,320 feet, and you want to get as high mile yeah. per hour as is possible. Otherwise, what's the point of building this big, amazing engine? Yeah, I mean, if you, if you built this great big engine, um, a 700-inch engine, and you had to be on a throttle stop for eight seconds, you're not going to run much speed. Um, so you really want to try to keep it around, you know, two and a half to three and a half second range. To get come back off the stop, so you got enough track to get back up to the 160, 70, 80 mile an hour, 90, whatever you're trying to achieve. So bigger carburetors, like in a comp eliminator engine, where they're they're going to stall the converter to 8600, and they can get by with too big of a venturi, and they they cross the finish line at 105 or 11,000 or whatever, or they're a stick shift car. But when you're talking about an automatic, and you have to take the engine RPM from stall speed down to 4,000 area, then back up to stall speed, and then accelerate the rest of the run, you need to be a little conservative on sizing from the venturi of the carburetor, the intake manifold, and the port cross-sectional area, and the camshaft. So for a great example is we can dyno camshafts on a 582 again or a 632, doesn't matter. And we can go up in duration and up in lobe separation and up in lift till we make monstrous horsepower, 1,350 horsepower out of a 632. You put it on the track and you try to go on the throttle stop, and there's, again, we're back to that velocity and airspeed. There's just not enough airspeed down there to keep this thing happy. And then when it comes off the stop, it's already in high gear, and it's got a motor away, and it's a slug. It won't accelerate. Um I, I tell this story. It's kind of it's kind of funny. I was at Indy several years ago, and a guy was talking about his comp motor that he got from a, a different engine builder, and how it was 30 horsepower better than his previous engine, but on the track it was slower. And he says, uh, you know, you need to invent some kind of a sensor to measure the rate of acceleration because this thing is just not accelerating. He says it may show better on the dyno, but it's just not accelerating. And I go, okay, I got it. And he's like, no, serious. I'm like, I'm serious. I got it. And he's like. What do you mean? I said, well, it's called the accelerometer slip. You get it that little white building at the end of the track. (laughs) And I said, that tells you how fast you accelerated in 1,320 feet. That's the accelerometer slip. That's the actual rate of acceleration. The car going down the drag strip, moving from a standing start to the finish line in 1,320 feet. It's not what the dyno says. What most people don't understand is the bulk of the dynos that are out there are are water brake style dyno. And when you put the engine on the dyno, you dictate how much you, how fast you want it to accelerate. You can put in 100 RPM per second, 300 or 600. So you're telling the dyno to let the engine accelerate at 600 RPM per second. If the engine is kind of a slug, it's just going to let some more water out to let it accelerate at that 600 RPM per second. But yet, it's still going to give you a horsepower reading. So really... A dyno is not a great way of measuring the rate of acceleration unless you want to spend several million dollars and get a a dyno that actually does that, like GM uses or NASCAR uses or whatever. But in the standard motorsports industry, a water brake dyno doesn't do a good job. That's why you can build twin engines, two or three engines the same, and one always outruns the other two. It's just the rate of acceleration, which goes back to the cross-sectional area of the head, the runner, the carburetor all of that, and the camshaft, and even the header size. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, 100%. So you got a lot of people I mean, out there who are, you know, they, they're just converting what they've got, right? Like, I want to go dot .90 racing. I'm going to buy a throttle stop and put it on there. And I know a guy who's done that recently, and he, he's won a couple of national opens, and he's having a great old time. But – if you're doing it from scratch and you're trying to do it the right way, you got to keep all of these things in mind. Let's talk about that acceleration. Why why is that important on the track? Well, because the the way that the the, the weight of the car, so a lighter car it's less important. You know, the minimum weight in supercom is 1300 pounds. I don't think I've ever seen anybody have a 1300 pound dragster. But if you did, that particular 
lightweight car, you could get by with too big of a cam, too big of a in, in a port, too, too big of all that stuff. And when you go all the way to Super Street with a 2,800-pound minimum, and most of them weigh actually 3,000 or more, um, now when that thing comes off the of stock, that's a lot of weight to get cycled back up and get the converter to flash back up. And depending on the weather, and this is a very common Super Street problem, is in the morning the air is good, the car's happy, it's pretty snappy, comes off the of stop well, it accelerates well, and, and they run 1085. And they go back in the afternoon, the weather's turned bad. They think the weather's only four or 500 slow. I'll just leave it alone. I should go 1090. It should be pretty close. And it goes 1095. And they're like, what the heck? And then they're like, my throttle stop's not right. And oftentimes it can even be, I mean, I'm in the carburetor business. It can be too big of a carburetor. And back to that whole velocity thing, there was no airspeed through it at three or four in the afternoon when it's 90 degrees. So you want to try to keep conservative on the, and the intake duration of the camshaft, lobe separation, cross-section area, and carburetor size, the heavier the vehicle, the more important it is to keep that airspeed and velocity up. Yeah, so what I'm seeing here, what I, my takeaway, Gary, is that, you know, is it possible to go by, you know, XYZ's, you know, crate engine and throw a throttle stop on it and go throttle stop? It certainly seems like, yeah, that's the answer. Yeah, you can do that, but if you really want that optimal package that is going to have championship winning potential we need to optimize all these areas to keep the port velocity up we've got to keep air speed up in the manifold through the venturi through the exhaust system you mentioned the headers you know we've got to have an exhaust system that you know that really works well i've got a you know a, a good friend of mine runs super street uh, he's also got a super comp dragster and i'll tell you he, you know he had he played with collectors on headers he had a custom set of headers built up in kingman arizona and after the fact, changed all these collectors, changed all this stuff, and came right back to the, exactly the way they were because that header, from everything I could see, had the best velocity through the header. Uh, it only had a Panavac system on it, but it also made the most pan vacuum, which spoke to me that this thing's got better velocity through the header than every other combination. So it hits to me that you're, you're really pointing out that everything's got to move air, and it's got to do it quickly. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's a combination, like you've heard your whole life, that's Everything in racing is all about the combination. But back to the dyno, for example, you really can't. You can dyno headers, you can dyno camshafts, you can dyno carburetors, and it will show you things. Usually, though, usually bigger on the dyno is better because the water break is just going to open the valve and let the water out and let the engine accelerate. And so usually bigger is better on a dyno. I rarely put any faith in dynoing headers on a dyno. I don't do it all that often. If you want to really know, you just got to run it down the racetrack, pull it with the weight and and, the, and, the, and even the quality of air. It's funny because the guys on the East Coast can get by with bigger stuff and lower throttle stop RPMs when they have a 30-something barometer. And then they come to Indy, and they all struggle. Where I live in the Midwest, in Kansas, we're in bad barometer, 28, 50 or worse, all the way down to Denver, 24 inches of barometer. And when we go to Indy, our stuff gets happy. We run faster. It dials better because of the barometric pressure is better. Because the barometric pressure is the pressure differential that you need from high pressure to low pressure going through the engine. That is that is a man God made velocity, you know. And so the better barometer you can get by with murder. It used to be um, ten fifteen years ago in the winter time, all these guys in Texas would sell all my carburetors that, that they had been running. And switch over to another brand that was much bigger because on the dyno, they'd bolt them on and say, I gained 40 horsepower. They'd go to Houston uh, Division or National in the early part of the year, great barometer, cool weather, and they'd run fast. By June and July, when they were in Tulsa, when they were in the bad air, they'd be calling me up and <laughs> rebuying new small carburetors again because their stuff would not dial and it wouldn't repeat and it had horrible drivability in bad air. So, Something you keep in mind when you're throttle stopping is where are where are you going to race? Where do you live? Where are you going to travel to? And what is the weather swing? And um, so got to keep that in mind also just because of the throttle stop RPM. And sometimes it's better off to get your throttle stop set in the, in the bad air and then let it be a little high when it's good air. So you get a, a database, you get some confidence in your ratio, and, and you understand what the car is doing rather than constantly 
try to adjust that and for each and every track you go to. Very interesting uh, thinking about all the different, like while Gary is going through this uh, description, Keith, I'm thinking about the people out there who are now going against everything he's saying and top end throttle stopping. They're just kind of running to a spot and shutting their car off and coasting and running 990 at 101 miles an hour. You've got a couple of friends that are doing that, Gary, like to, to combat all the science that has gone into your end of it. Yeah, so one of my bestest friends for the last 30, 40, 40 years now, Timmy Nicholson with a Linko and a small block, you know, he runs it out. And then when it hits a given RPM, um, just past a thousand foot, he just lets off the gas. And so he's wide open, like a wide open, the car will normally run low nines. So he's wide open to the thousand foot and then he lets off the gas and it coasts. Now the advantage he has with a stick shift, it's gear bound. So his rear end gear ratio is going to drag the car down to go 990 at, at 95 mile an hour. And it repeats pretty well, but he's given up any finish line driving. So he can't tell if the guy is two tenths slow, he doesn't know it. And he can plow right through and go an 89, nine and lose. And so the other guy though, can't tell what Timmy's doing because he's so slow at 95 mile an hour. It doesn't really matter if Timmy's going 990 with a something or 992 that guy's not going to be able to drive the finish line so it's basically uh, i've said a million times is pick which way you want to lose <laughs> you know i mean it's it's tough but you can do it much more economical if you're going to do the top end thing and uh, well, you can do it with an automatic and it's been done with an automatic it's not quite as effective because the converter will slip differently between the starting line and that thousand foot and so it still moves with the weather well as a stick shift card does it. but and you got to keep in mind that when you do the top end charge wind is a bigger factor than it is if i'm going 180 or 90 mile an hour i have a ratio for how much the headwind is worth but if you're going um and going 90 mile an hour when you lift at the thousand foot let's say and you're coasting and that's a headwind it's going to slow you down a lot more than when if you're on the gas through the entire run so but still, going back to the engine, um, even if you're going to th top in throttle stop, you still want that engine to be the most efficient it can be. And so even on Timmy's car, we don't run a 1050 Dominator on that, and a 400 small block certainly could. You just run a 950 Holly on it because you're not trying to go fast anyway. So you're just trying to be very consistent. And the smaller the Venturi, the more efficient it's going to be. And I think that is uh, ultimately a takeaway you, you, you're building it for acceleration and velocity as opposed to, you know, maximum uh, power and ET. Correct. you got to look at the average power of the window you're going to be in. So if your converter stalls uh, 6,300 and um, you're going to cross the finish line at 73 to 7,500, you got 1,000 to 1,200 RPM band. So is that where the engine makes the most power, average power between those two points? So every time we dyno an engine, we, we line those up on a computer screen and figure the average between the two and move the cursors back and forth until it says this is where it's happy. That dictates to you what the converter should stall and, in, and what gear you should have and what you should cross the finish line at. And um, so and I'm being an advocate here for a dyno. All the guys out there listening that have never that, that build their own engines at home it is well worth the six or seven hundred dollars a day to carry your engine to somebody that can dyno it for you and learn where it makes peak horsepower, where it makes peak torque, and and understand all that, and uh, know where where the converter should stall, what you should cross the finish line at, how how hard does it fall off after peak power, how broad is the torque curve, so it's it's well worth that money to dyno your engine. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more, Gary. I mean, I'll have, you know, completely unrelated things with customers, and they're trying to hunt this issue and trying to hunt that issue. And, you know, I ask them, you know, hey, you know, what kind of numbers do you have? Can you give me information off the dyno? What's, you know, what are the air fuels like? What's brake specific? How many pounds an hour is pulling? And because this goes back to my early days, you know, bracket racing and working into the supers, you know, kind of like so many guys out there. And I'm, I'm, I'm the advocate and backing up what Gary says here. It would take me an entire season to learn, and I shouldn't say even the word learn, really educated guess 
what's going on versus what I could learn in a day or even a half a day on the dyno, trying to figure out, you know, what's the right cam, where should the cam be, headers, different sizes. Again, all season long, bolting this on, bolting that on, taking this off, taking this on, moving the camera on, figure it out in a day and just go racing. And, you know, we'll say end of the day, a lot less work at the racetrack and a better result at the end of the day. So let's talk about something. You touched on a couple of things there that uh, uh, misconception. And uh, I, I want to just talk on that because I get so many phone calls about it. Let's talk about it. Maybe help some of these people out is O2s and brake specific fuel consumption numbers. So for decades, when people would dyno engines, they tried to jet them by looking at the brake, brake specific fuel consumption numbers. And if, if the number got big, then they thought it was rich. So first off, uh, let me define big. So forever, I'm um, talking in the 80s, maybe back in the 70s, but in the 80s and the 90s when I was learning all all my stuff on dynoing and I, I was doing a lot of that, um, everybody thought the perfect brake specific number was a .400. And basically, so let's, let's learn how do we get to this. Where does this brake specific number come from? It is the raw horsepower divided by the fuel in pounds per hour that the engine consumes to make that horsepower. So if we had a, a thousand horsepower engine raw that's uncorrected and we use 400 pounds of fuel per hour, that's going to be a 0 .40 brake specific. So for a long time, years, people thought that's our target. We need to get this thing to be a 0 .40. And they would change jets. And I done it at a lot of places and with a lot of different people. And, and that's what they would do, manipulate the jet to try to get a 0 .40 brake specific. Now, Actually, as we refine the engines and the cylinder heads got better and the cams and everything got better, now it's not uncommon to have .35 brake specifics, 3.4, 3.6, 3.7. .3 but that's not really the jetting. If you really study it, brake specific is the efficiency of the engine in, tr in transferring or um, converting fuel into horsepower. That's the efficiency. That's why you can have a .35 brake specific and still make more power. It's it's really efficient. It's not that. And when you see a brake, you see a, they call it the fuel curve. When you see the fuel curve and you see the brake specifics start out at point three five six seven or eight, and then they by the end of the pole they're at point four six. People go, oh, it's fat up high. I need to change the high speed air bleed. No, it's inefficient. It's inefficient. So um, I was telling I was telling Keith this story a few weeks ago. This is hilarious. So all about efficiency and even velocity and so you got to understand why does an engine make peak torque where it makes peak torque because peak torque happens where the engine is its most perfect efficiency that's where everything is happening perfectly it's like being 21 years old again <laughs> right we're 21 we're in the best shape condition we're ever going to be unfortunately after age 21 as a male we're going to go downhill well, that's the same thing with your torque. Wherever peak torque happens, whether it's a it's a street engine and peak torque is at 3,200 or a full-out race engine and it's at 6,500, after peak torque, it goes downhill. Why does it go downhill? Because it becomes inefficient. Why does it become inefficient? Because now the air and the fuel is too fast. It's too fast to process it accurately. So, and if you're old enough, like Keith and I, <laughs> to remember Lucy Ricardo, the Lucy, I love Lucy's show. She was actually got a Ricky made her get a job. She went to a donut factory, and her job was to put these six or eight donuts in a box and close a lid. They're coming down the conveyor belt. She's put the donuts in the box. They're going down. She gets pretty good. She's doing good. They speed up the conveyor belt, and then she starts trying to cram the donuts in the box, and they're not going in. And she it goes faster and faster. She starts having donuts everywhere. Starts shoving them down her shirt, shoving them in her mouth. They're falling off the conveyor belt. And she's cramming in a box, and of course it ends with the typical "I love Lucy." She starts crying and bawling, and it's it's a hilarious skit. That's what happens to your engine. It starts processing air and fuel, and it's making power, it's making torque, it's going up. And after peak torque, whatever that number is, the air speed and the velocity and the fuel are too fast to produce continue producing maximum torque at that rate. We now go past 350 feet per second, 400, 500, 600, 700 plus feet per second. The fuel is now banging off the back wall, the short turn of the head, and going into the cylinder, all helter-skelter, and we're losing torque. It's going downhill. 
But why do we keep making horsepower? Because it's a math equation. It's a simple math equation. It's torque times RPM divided by 5252. What that equation means is that every single engine on planet Earth at 5252 RPM have identical torque and horsepower. So why does the horsepower keep climbing after peak torque? Why does it keep going up? Because it's a four-digit number in the equation. Torque, typically a three-digit, but can be four. But RPM is a four-digit number. So obviously, if the torque doesn't fall off too bad, it just starts to taper down. But you're RPMing up, and you're going past six and seven and eight and 9,000 RPM, the horsepower keeps climbing up. At some point, the airspeed is so fast and the fuel and airspeed is so fast that it falls off, even the horsepower, even the RPM can't save it, right? So basically, we need when, you, when you're dyno an engine, you can't just look at brake-specific only because brake-specific is just showing you how inefficient the engine is up high. You can simply, at that point, if you want that brake-specific to come down, now you can enlarge the carburetor. And slow the airspeed down or enlarge the intake runners or, or even the camshaft, and that brake specific will come back in line. But now you're going to give up something down low because everything in an internal co- combustion engine is a compromise, everything. You can't have all of it. So – and then back to, the, to what I said about O2 sensors. Everybody calls, and they, they get O2 sensors, and they read it, and they're trying to manipulate the jet to make the, air, the O2s be right. Wait a minute. Hold up. Hold the phone. How do you know what's right? The first mistake everybody makes is that the, that the fuel, all of them have a different specific gravity, and they all have a different stoichiometric number. It's generally cons- – you know, everybody thinks 14.7 is the stoichiometric of gasoline. That's an average. That's not what your fuel is. And so whatever the stoichiometric is, then that changes the lambda number of 0.88 or 0.89, which is basically the air-fuel ratio inverted – which would be 13.2 or 12.8. So you don't know what your engine wants without knowing your fuel, your stoichiometric, and all that stuff. And you don't know. And no, all, all eight cylinders are not alike. And so it's like having eight people on a board committee meeting. They're not all going to be the same. So one cylinder might want to be 12.8. One might want to be 13.2. One might be 13.7. And so you can't just dictate to the engine – that we want, we're going to manipulate the jets on this engine until they all are 13.2 and then have your chest poked out because you might have just left 10 or 15 horsepower on the table. The best way, even with 802 sensors in an engine, is to read the spark plug. It's the soldier that's out in the war zone. It's got its head out in the war zone. Don't listen to the po- politicians in Washington telling you the war's going great, we're winning. Talk to the soldier that's out there in the rice paddy, right? So read the spark plug. Don't believe your O2. Read the spark plug and read the time slip, the accelerometer slip. That's how you go the best. How about that, Keith? I love it. I absolutely love it. I got golf claps going over here because everything you said is 100% dead on. You know, talking with Lake Speed, you know, our other partner here, you know, you know about reed vapor pressure rates and stoichiometry and looking at the fuel distillation curves and – you know, one of the things I deal with is, is and, and I know Gary does this all the time, and it's from a ring point of view. I'll have customers that they travel, and, you know, they're going to this track, and they're going to that track. And, you know, that at this track, they're buying, you know, this brand of fuel, and at that track, they're buying this brand of fuel, and at the next track, they're buying this other brand of fuel. And ultimately, they end up having some sort of a, a, a we'll say, tuning-related issue in a ring failure. They've, they've annealed the ring. They've knocked the coatings off the ring. They've done something. And, it all, and the one question it always comes down to is, well, are you traveling with the same fuel and, and running this same fuel every day? No, no, no. I use, you know, literally four or five brands of fuel, but they're all 110 octane. And no. Ex- exactly. There's no correctment, correction adjustments being done, you know, for these different brands of fuel. And it's a very, very overlooked situation that, as you and I both know, uh, can lead to catastrophic failure simply because they are not all the same. It changes the ring gap even, right? Absolutely. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, the, the, depending on what fuel you're running can change the ring gap. It, it, so. It's funny you mentioned that. I had a gentleman that was in here in Will Call just the other day. He had an old MG, 72 MG, and he, he's had some issues with it. And 
you know, just the things like you talked about reading plugs. You know, I'm looking at the piston. I'm looking at the rings. It's got this real light black bit of soot on it. And, and he swears his lambdas are right on it. Well, you know what? The parts are telling me different. I've got this real fine black soot everywhere. It's on the piston. It's on the rings. I said, this, this is telling me it's overfueled. The rings are describing they're overfueled to me. But the one thing I'm looking at is the end gaps. It has butted the end gaps of the rings. And I, well, how'd you set these? Well, the, you know, the British Leyland book shows 11 thousandths on the top and 8 thousandths on the second. Uh, this is about a 2795 bore, so you know all of you out there don't don't get too freaked out. It's kind of a small bore engine. I said, well, that that was all fine and dandy in 1972 on the leaded fuels that you could purchase in England at the time. But how does that relate to 2023 when on a good day you're looking at 87 octane and an oxygenated fuel? Yeah, those exactly. rules don't apply. I mean, you got to read the, the rings, and, and we've learned so much from reading the end gaps on the rings over the decades and seeing – and you'd be just shocked at some of the end gaps that we end up with in different combinations based on reading um, the end gaps or looking at the engine on, on teardown, right? Uh, what Dick Maskins called one day, I was talking to him, and he said, well, empirical data tells us this. Empirical data tells us that. And I got off the phone with him, like, man, I feel stupid. What does empirical data mean? Empirical means experience. <laughs> it's just a fancy exactly. way it sounded smart. <laughs> so when you have empirical data looking at piston end gaps and go, wow, I didn't have enough end gap, that's why the ring end gaps butted. They, the ring turns square when it butts, and you lose power, and it hurts the cylinder wall, and it won't come back till you fix it. So. And, and he had all of the above happening. <laughs> Yeah, so fuel, I mean, everything in the entire process from top to bottom needs to be studied in every possible way. You can't read too much, let me explain that. And uh, you, can't, you can't stop learning. I mean, just study it and think about it, but you can't assume, don't assume anything and study everything. I love it. I love it. Okay, so we're coming down the stretch here, and my, you know, my head is spinning, and partly I'm thinking, like, why am I bothering to get involved in this, right? Like, what is going on here? But no, I'm doing it. I'm excited. I want to go dot ninety racing, and everybody's having a great time out there. Um, but like a, fi a final uh, thought, Gary, on this, I, I think that there's going to be some people that are interested. There are people who are doing it who are maybe going to do it in a different way. There are people who have got engines that they're building that um, might think differently about what you've said um is there a moral to the story like a final conclusion that you'd like to put out there man i don't know um because I, I have one more question i just want to make sure we get to the final conclusion like i want to know well, is there a right speed to go right because it was like faster and faster and faster and i remember there people were trying to go 200 miles an hour and troy coughlin had the first super gasser over 190 and he won because no one could judge him he was so fast but then people like yourself pushed the edge of the envelope and then kind of came back like yeah you know you can go too fast maybe you can make too much power what is uh what you know what is your thought on that and you can work on your moral while you're doing that okay well, so uh, this is funny because when we first started this the throttle stop stuff we didn't have timers and we were going 890 with a fixed throttle stop blade at 151 149 to 151 and uh, i built a new engine over that uh, i think it was the 93 94 winter went down to the dallas race and i and they just we had just gotten timers so you could go on and off the throttle stop and i was going 890 at 164 and i mean scotty richardson came over and he's like what is that beast I'm like, it's a 468. Oh, my God. You know, they've been running 427s or small block. And he's like, 164. Well, I ended up running Scotty in the final round of the U.S. National that year, and I beat him because I had 164 mile an hour, and he was going 159. And uh, he actually dialed on us. He never dials on us ever. Probably the last time he ever did in his life was that run. He dialed on us, and I drove up on him, and then he dumped, and I won the U.S. Nationals going 164. Well, then – Years later, we go by, and then we're going to go 170, and they're like, oh, 170, that's going to be crazy. You won't be able to judge anybody. And then next thing you know, we're going 175, 180. And I remember when 180 was a big deal, and we finally, you know, Billy Torrance and I both went 180, and it was huge. And now we've gone 190, 192, 193, 194, and, uh, you know, there's people going 195. And, and I keep – every time you think, you think, oh, it's just getting – out of control. I mean, right now at 190 uh, or 190, 191, that last increment, 
from the thousand foot to the finish line is 1.17 seconds. So when you're driving up on a guy that's going 890 at 170 anything, and he's going to run that last section in 126 or 125, I've got a little over one second. At the thousand foot, I'm a tenth behind him. I've got 1.17 seconds to make up my mind. A, can I catch him? B, will I be able to get out of the throttle and get in front of him? And C, can I take this strike by two or three or six or seven thousands, whatever? That's a lot happening in 1.17 seconds. And so is it, can you be too fast? Yes. I think when I, and there'll be people soon enough to go 200, you won't be able to judge anybody. At 190, you really can't. You're almost into a rhythm. If you think you're going to hold two or three hundreds, that you know how to get rid of two or three hundreds from the thousand foot to the finish line. So what is the speed? It's settled in right now. If you're if you're uh, if you just won the lottery, Joe, and you're going to order this hundred thousand dollar dragster, and you said I don't want to go 190, I want something that's comfortable. About 180 to 182, 183. That's a nice number. 184, just something in the low 180s is you chase most everybody, and um, you can still dial it. It's not out of control, and you can kind of judge the finish line. But that's in super comp. Now, you're going to run super street. So basically, if you think about it, 10-mile-an-hour differential, let's put it to you that way. If you can be within 10-mile-an-hour differential of the fastest and the slowest, you can be able to judge them both directions. You can look over your shoulder. You can also come up on them, and the car should be able to dial so if most of the fast super street cars, the really fast ones are 1090 at 150, yep. a little bit over, and most of the slow ones are 130s, yep. something. 130. Then if you can just, yeah, if you can be in the one mid one, you know, round 140-ish to 1423, you're you're going to be good. That's great. Super exciting. Keith, a uh, final question for Gary. Well, Gary, I just you know. This is going to lead to a whole nother thing. And we're talking about engines that do anything here, but Garrett and I have spent a lot of time. I mean, every form of racing is the most unbelievable complexity out there. And, and as with anything out there, it, we've said this, there's more ways to lose than there is to win. But I find the super classes to be, you know, I- I- extremely intriguing because, you know, when you've got a package that, you know, you know, <laughs> you know a few thousands is the difference. Uh you know, uh, unbelievable stuff, and, and and making the engine work, but to, to dive down the other parts, and this will this will turn into a whole other episode that's not an engine. I mean, because Gary and I've talked about you know starting line, how the car stages, how we put it into the beam, where it's in the beam, what's the ride height, converter, rear. Is is there any one thing in the car that you think is the most overlooked thing, Gary? I guess is where I'm. Going. Oh, that's a great, great. That's a great question. I was actually thinking about this all week before we had this deal. I meant, I meant to say this earlier. For a super class car, there's four things that are super important, no pun intended, but super important. I mean, don't go to the racetrack unless you – to compete, you can go and test, but don't go and compete unless you have these four things correct. Carburetor, throttle stop, torque converter, and tires. You can have a pretty rough car. You cannot have the suspension or any of that stuff. But if you have those four, or, or the other way around, you can have the state-of-the-art best car money can buy. But if you missed on the converter or the stop or the carburetor or the rear tires in superclass racing, you are not even close. And, uh, I mean, I- I'll give you one quick example. I had a customer just that been struggling all year long, finally sent the carburetor back that I built, and he had changed the jets, and he'd gone to a uh, pin gauge style of jet but he didn't understand that it wasn't the same as the 88 Holly jet that was in it. So he had an 88 pin size jet in it. So the thing was only like having what would be typically of like a 77, 78 Holly jet. Pin size is too small, basically. Couldn't dial the thing at all. It was a nightmare. Way slow, way fast, could not dial. Simple thing is the carburetor wasn't right because he made a mistake on the jetty. The throttle stop, the converter is so critical. It, the converter is the super class racing as the clutches are to pro stock and the fuel classes. So. Nope. I'm just letting that one sink in right there. The converter, the tires. Why, why, why so important on tires? Don't they just need to be rub, oh, rubber and the, fat? The compound, the compound and the sidewall construction are for the reaction time in the 60 foots because in, in uh, throttle stop racing, it's, it's like this in every class. But in my super stock car, if it moves around a few 3,000, 5,000, 6,000, 
11 thou and 60 foot, it really doesn't hurt the ET at the finish line that much. In superclass racing, you lose three, you can lose, so like, oh, let, me, let me correct that. Super stock, you may only lose a hundredth or something in 60 foot. In throttle stop racing, if the carburetor or the stop is not right, you can lose three or four or five hundredths in 60 foot and don't even know it. And you're going down there thinking you're going to 90 or thinking you're going to 87 and you're going 93 and you don't know it. And that's how you lose. More times than not, if you took a, a poll, if you had a set at the end of at the track at the time slip booth and when the, everybody got their time slip and he said, how did you lose? And they'd say, I was slow. Why? And they'd go, oh, look, I lost 60 foot. So the tire, by design, and, and depending on the cars, from Super Street through Super Gas or Super Comp, and depending on the big block, small block, four link, da-da-da-da, there is a part number that is like the tire for that combination among all three brands. So, I mean, I've ran them all. I've ran everything, Hoosier and Goodyear and Mickey's and all of them. But there will be a specific part number for that combination with that. And so – you need to get the tire pressure right. You've got to have the converter right. You've got to have your throttle stop correct of how it, it applies on and off and the RPM you set it at. you got to have the golden carburetor. When you have all those four ingredients, even a bad car will be pretty darn good. And if you don't have those right, the greatest car will not work at all. Excellent. I think that qualifies as the final thought, Keith. I Absolutely. Words of wisdom from Gary himself. Yeah. No, that's that's great stuff. Uh, while we got you, I got two more things I want to ask Gary. You're going to love this, Keith. But uh, first of all, fog it. How are things going? They're going great. We recently, just last week, got bumped up on Amazon from a regular Amazon product to Amazon Choice, meaning we're the number one uh, high-performance fogging oil they're recommending. And uh, we're shipping out more and more. In fact, Steve took the day off to hand-deliver a full pallet to a, a, one of our uh, – stores in california he drove over there and dropped another pallet off it's uh, it's taken off uh more and more and more people are starting to order larger orders than last year instead of a can they buy a case instead of a case they're buying three or four cases and it's funny because a lot of them say you know the the first case i bought i only got to use two or three cans because i loved it so much i gave two or three cans away to all my buddies <laughs> you know so it's it's going great we've got some deals working with some of the big, big distributors in the United States. I can't name names yet, but, uh, no, it's going great. Excellent, excellent. And, uh, Keith, the other day I'm talking to Gary, right? We're talking camshafts on Pontiac and the whole thing. And uh, this conversation, like how much duration, how much velocity, that that deal. But uh, this past week I was at the Texas Motorplex, and I was there for the Stampede of Speed and the NHRA Fall Nationals, and we're, we're talking – Motorplex stories and Gary's like yeah you know I remember we went in there uh, I was with Warren Johnson and we went in to the Motorplex for a match race against Ray and Morrison and it was just like an afterthought that the guy drops that like hint of a story and it's just like what you were you match racing pro stock Warren Johnson against Ray and Morrison in Texas in the beginning of the Texas Motorplex and I just thought like that's an amazing story so I told Gary to think about it and recollect what he could. And now's the time, Gary. What do you got? Well, I'll tell the story the way I told you is that uh, uh, it was brand new. The Motorplex was brand spanking new. They wanted to have an op- a grand opening, so they hired uh, Warren to, to come over there and match race against Bruce Allen. And uh, so Kurt didn't need to go, so it was just going to be me and Warren. So I asked if my girlfriend, now my wife, Joyce could ride along, and uh, Arlene went. So the four of us in a cab over GMC semi, <laughs> we we drove over from Atlanta to uh, to the Motorplex, and when we got there, this place is brand new, brand spanking new. There's no grass anywhere, so it's just black dirt everywhere that they've put up the chain link fences and everything. And my girlfriend or my wife, my current wife, and I, she doesn't get mad at this, so it's just a funny. She'd never been out of the state of Georgia. She had been asleep during the night. We drove all night. And when we roll in there in the morning, she looks out the window and she goes, what's all over the ground? And I said, I don't know. And I look and I go, dirt? She goes, that's not dirt. I'm like, yeah, that's dirt. She goes, no, everybody knows dirt's red. (laughs) (laughs) So that was the first time she saw black dirt. Anyway, we ran ran the two out of three match race. And I believe, but I didn't go check my facts. I'm pretty sure we won two out of three, but I don't, I wouldn't swear to it. But uh, yeah, that was opening day. I was at the Motorplex 
And uh, the better story, though, the best story ever, the best Warren Johnson story ever, if you have time, is Warren and I went back later that summer to test. And just him and I, Bubba Corzine, if anybody knows that name, was running the tree. Sure. And there was some guy in the tower. And we would back the car out and just park right by the, the gate opening there on the north side and pull in the water box in the left lane. And Warren would do five 60-foot launches. And he just back up, low gear, back up, low gear, back right? And I had a little notepad, and the guy in the tower would just read out the 60 foots. You know, so I'd write down 1021, 1024, 102, whatever. And then we would go back to the pits and uh, I'd pull the tranny out, service the clutch, rotate the tires and warn to run the valves and do that stuff. And then we'd make a suspension change. Well, what we found that day was that to get the four link and the 60 foot's better, we kept having to lower the ride height on the back of the car. Well, pretty soon on an 86 Forenza, the corner edge of the tire was getting into the, to the quarter pound. So hmm, this is a problem. We need more offset wheel, narrower end. What are we going to do? And Warren says, we'll just take the brakes off the back. Okay, <laughs> then we'll just plug the lines. We're only doing low gear launches. So I take the brake rotors off, the calipers off, all that, plug the lines. We have front brakes. Well, we go up there. He makes the first launch, backs up another one. And on the fifth hit, I hear him let go, and he goes down to there, whop, 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 pulls in gears. And I'm like, Oh, crap. I said something different. And I, I look at Bubba Corzine. He goes, what? I go, he doesn't have any brakes. And he goes, how do you know? I says, because I took them off. There's a trailer. And about that time, back then they were going 750s. It went like 752, 186. The chute came in one chute, by the way. The chute came out. He changed from the left, clear to the right lane, gravel dust everywhere. And back then you drove the cars back. So he got out and wrapped the chute up and just came island back with a you know, what eating grin on his face and pulled in the trailer. And I said, you crazy SOB. He's like, what a problem. You know, Warren's so dry. No, no, what a problem. No big deal. You changed lanes. <laughs> so anyway, we serviced the car and we didn't do anything with the brakes. We just serviced the clutch and made some more changes, whatever. And we went back up. Now it's like five, six o'clock in the evening. And he makes three or four more launches. Nobody says anything. Anyway, on the fifth one, he let her rip. Up, 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 up. And I'm like, oh, no. Bubba looks at me and says, not again. I go, yeah. He goes, don't bring that thing back up the start line. I go, we're not. We're done. <laughs> no rear brakes going 180 mile an hour at the motorplex. The legend <laughs> continues. The legend continues. Gary, this has been awesome. Thank you very much for a deep dive into uh, you know, th and engine building for throttle stops, right? Hopefully people are interested out there. And as you said, thousands and thousands of people around the country are licensed for this style of racing. Uh, the best of the best are running at the NHRA national event level, but people can do it at the divisional level. That's where I'm going to go, and uh, it's going to be a lot of fun, but I'm looking forward to it. And, and as you mentioned, right, watching Robert Height, whose daughter is getting involved, Antron Brown's son, Anson, is getting involved. This is where uh, you, you kind of cut your teeth. Sean Langdon, a two-time and back-to-back -back world champion. You're a four-time world champion. Like this, There's a lot of intense racing going on here. Uh, the throttle stop is... Let's face it, it's confusing to some people. Hopefully, this has illuminated the subject a little bit, and people will take a second look. I hope so. Just remember, keep your velocity up. Simple as that. Gary, thank you so much. All right, thanks, guys. Thanks, Gary. Really appreciate it, man. That was insightful. Thank you. Okay, see you. There he goes, Gary Stinnett. How about that, Keith? This is a good one. You, you guys put this one together. Yeah, you know, it was just one of those things. Gary and I kind of talked a little about it. You and I kind of talked a little bit about, you know, the throttle stop thing. It's like, I, I got to get Gary on here. We, we got to talk about throttle stop engines and, you know, what do we focus on? What's, you know, is the focus, you know, maximum horsepower? It's not. It's about acceleration and getting that car down the racetrack. And we'll just say the rest is history. So, yeah, I'm glad to, I'm glad Gary was able to come on and spend, you know, some of his day with us. We all know how busy he is. Uh, that was awesome. Yeah, any story, though, that's got Warren Johnson and Ray Aaron Morrison and the Motorplex and Gary and all that involved, I you know, I had to put him on the spot for that one. Oh, yeah, 100%. Brakes? Well, we don't need no stinking brakes. Yeah, well, that's Warren. Warren, I don't know if Warren's going to dispute it. Warren, are you out there? You're welcome on the show, uh, of course. But um, what about Total Seal? What's going on over there, Keith? And for folks out there who are 
uh, working on their programs. It's getting to be that time of the year. PRI is coming up. Of course, Total Seal will be at PRI. will be there and doing interviews from the booth. It's going to be very interesting and exciting. You'll be back at PRI this year. All kinds of good stuff going on. But uh, if people want to get ahead of the end season rush, right, the refresh rush, what should they do? You know, reach out to us right now. It's, it, it's what I'll call it. You know, it's busy. Uh, we don't really seem to have a downtime anymore like we used to in the old days. Uh, but, you know, the rush is coming, you know, by mid-December. With, you know, the whole thing, you know, it's on like Donkey Kong. So if you want to get your order in, get it in now. If you know you got a bill coming up, you know what you're going to need, you know, get us that call. Get it in now. Reach out to us, TotalSeal.com or the phone number 800 800- Eight seven four two seven five three. You know, we're glad to help you talk about you know the new things that we have coming up that we'll be talking about at the PRI show. Can't give it away now, but we'll have some things to talk about there. And you know, call us, talk to us, let us know what it is you want to do and what you expect out of it, and we'll guide you down that path. Whether it be a powerful streetcar or a throttle stop engine, they can do it all. Keith, great job as usual. Thank you so much. Oh, I appreciate that, Joe. But I want to touch on one thing here, folks, before we go. One of the things that you know, we talk about with Hidden Horsepower is, you know, this is a historical document. This is being recorded for the ages. And unfortunately, last week we, we lost a great engine builder out there. Ron Hutter, Hutter Racing Engines, passed away last week. Not only a great customer, he was a good friend, as his family is to me. And his wife, Thelia, reached out to me over the weekend to thank me and to thank Joe and Total Seal and the entire Hidden Horsepower family for having Ron on there and creating this historical document because any time that she needs to hear his voice, she can go there and hear her husband. And that, we'll just say, that brought a tear to my eye. Episode 37, September 28, 2021. Uh, I remember, Ron, but I hadn't considered it the way you just mentioned it. Like, that's... uh, that is unbelievable, obviously, to the family. May he rest in peace. And so many of the greats are you know, getting up there, let's face it, as are we, Keith. We're, we're getting up there. You had Gary. He's quoting I Love Lucy, right? We're getting up there. But this is documenting talent and ability and story. It's, it's a life bio, and uh, I didn't know about Ron. And so thank you for mentioning that, and let's keep doing it. Absolutely. Looking forward to the next one. Excellent. Thank you, Keith. He's Keith Jones. I'm Joe Costello. You can hear me on WFO Radio podcast as well. For you podcast listeners, we interview drag racers, winning drag racers on a regular basis, and uh, have a lot of fun as well. Also out on the NHRA tour, where I am one of the track announcers. Super excited about the winter break and all that is coming up on Hidden Horsepower. So give us a like, write a review, five stars, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, wherever you get your podcasts. And most importantly, tell your friends. I think they'll enjoy it as well. And we'll see you next time on this edition of Hidden Horsepower, presented by Total Seal.